Welcome to Body Kindness. I'm Rebecca Scritchfield, creator of the Body Kindness Philosophy book and audiobook. I'm here to help you create a better life by reinventing health from the body oppressive, shaming, and you'll never be enough type of mindset to positive and joyful ways that you can spiral up your energy, mood, and your well being at any size, shape, or weight, and as you are right now. Get started for free at bodykindnessbook.com slash start. That's the sound of me smashing a stack of scales in front of some friends. And I have to say that breaking up with the scale and all the other ways I was judging, monitoring, and measuring my worth was absolutely pivotal in my life. Creating the body kindness philosophy and letting myself be a human being again helped me become a better mom, a better clinician, and a happier and healthier person. I believe we all have a right to decide how we want to care for ourselves, and I think we all need support in figuring out what that looks like. You don't have to do this alone. There's a whole community of like-minded people who are fed up with diets, who are embracing intuitive eating, and who are completely redefining their lives from body shame to body kindness. You are not broken. Our culture is. Find your inner caregiver and create a better life with body kindness. Trauma itself, unless it's resolved, unless it's allowed to deactivate, unless there's something actively done to release it from the system, it won't leave the system. And if the systems of oppression remain as they do, then it's going to continue to be perpetuated. And that's why people talk about reparations. That's why they talk about equity. That's why they talk about inheritance of wealth. That's why they talk about, you know, shifting funds. That's why it's talked about in a way that is reconciling, where there's remorse, where there's grief on behalf of people who have inherited privileges based on racial privileges, racial advantages, based on just being white. And that there's that that kind of trauma, that cultural trauma needs to be worked through in order for us to be able to actually move toward collective healing because it doesn't help white people either. That's the problem. Everybody thinks that like we're all just going to win the one percent or lottery game and all be billionaires, but that's not how it works. That's that's it's necessarily exclusive. And we have this because of this libertarian sort of mentality, this meritocracy of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, do it, you can. There's a place for that, right? Where there's a place for effort. There's a place for discipline. I'm not saying that. Mindfulness teachings call it virya. It means that you have a certain energy, a certain dedication to something. That's good. That's a good quality to have. But you need to be able to recognize that that's separate from, you know, being the recipient of this constant state of threat, which people who are in black bodies in this country are, that doesn't exist when you don't exist in a black body. That was Francesca Marguerite Maxime, and she's at MaximeClarity.com. She's a Haitian, Dominican, Italian, American, IMTA accredited certified mindfulness meditation teacher, mentored by Jack Cornfield a somatic experiencing trauma healing practitioner, indigenous focusing oriented therapy practitioner, relational life therapy couples coach, focusing oriented therapy practitioner, and award-winning poet, author, and former television news anchor and reporter. Francesca is based in Brooklyn, New York, where she sees adults, couples, and groups in person and online and teaches therapists and other trauma specialists about mindfulness, the nervous system, attachment, embodiment, and racialized trauma. Francesca also hosts the Be Here Now Network podcast where she explores the intersection of psychology, neuroscience, spirituality, social justice, and the creative arts. 
Francesca was also the recipient of the 2019 International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies Student Advocacy and Service Award for her contributions in the field of advocacy, clinical work, and traumatic stress, as well as the 2019 first prize winner of the Allen Ginsberg Poetry Awards for her poem, Pleather, recently featured on PBS television. She was also featured in the article, Spreading the Word About Racialized Trauma, by the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. More about Francesca can be found on her website at maximaclarity.com. I'm so excited to share this conversation with you. It is amazing, necessary, so helpful. I don't even want to give you the highlights because I feel like her tea said it all. The only two notes I want to make, um, make sure you listen to the whole thing toward the end. She invites me to dip in into a brief somatic experiencing exercise. Um, I also want to make sure that you are aware um, of some new offerings that she has that includes uh, courses um, around racialized trauma and racism. And please check out the show notes for all the details that you can get about that and the opportunities that we have related to this podcast. Um, Thank you so much. If you have any questions, thoughts, or concerns, you can always email me. It's Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. Francesca, welcome to Body Kindness. It's nice to meet you, Rebecca, and thanks for having me on the show. Oh, I'm so grateful uh, for you and giving your time and expertise and insight. I know it's going to help me personally, and it's going to help all the Body Kindness listeners as well. Um, I usually like to let folks know how I came to find someone else, and I came to find you through um, your podcast. Um, So I'd love to talk about that. It was a particular episode interview that you did with Dick Schwartz, who is the founder of Internal Family Systems, which I love. Um, It's part of the body kindness philosophy that's used as far as our healthy approaches to well, well-being and mindful self-care. And I'm always fascinated to hear um, Dick Schwartz talk. And, and especially you guys were in conversation about his racist parts and racism and the two pandemics of COVID and racism. And it was such an interesting conversation. I'll, I will be sure to share that link in the show notes. And um, and then getting to know you, I found out that you do all this amazing anti-racism work. So I would love to start there to let the listeners know more about your background and experience and, and what you want them to know about the kind of work that you're doing right now. Sure. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, I really appreciate Dick's approach to, you know, legacy burdens and um, intergenerational trauma. And I think he says the four sort of cultural traumas are are materialism, individualism, uh, patriarchy or sexism, and racism. And I think that, you know, the IFS, the internal family systems approach that he uses is really helpful because a lot of people want to defend and say, you know, um, I am not racist. I am not a racist, but it's a little bit more open and possible to say, yeah, I have a racist part. Right. And like, even that maybe sounds harsh, but at the mm-hmm. same time, it's a little easier to acknowledge and to sort of begin to digest and say, okay, well, how did this, you know, racist part come into being and, and why is it here and what is it here to teach me and how can I help unburden it? in a way that allows it to live with greater facility ease and bring in more self-energy, which is our metacognitive and our mindful awareness. So yeah, so Dick's interview was really just, um, I think one of the trauma practitioners, like, you know, obviously his model is very popular that I felt was already there where he was already talking about some of these issues, whereas some of the other models are still trying to find their way because they've talked about trauma, but they haven't talked about systemic oppression and systemic racism. So some of the work that I personally do right now as a trauma healing practitioner, as a somatic experiencing practitioner, as a you know, psychotherapist and as a, as a person who works with, you know, as a certified mindfulness teacher and with indigenous focusing and focusing and relational life therapy, all these certifications that I have, they're all really about recognizing sort of from a polyvagal theories perspective, you know, what Stephen Porges talks about in terms of nervous system regulation, bringing your body back to balance, 
being able to restore, you know, your capacity to sort of ride the waves of activation and, you know, sort of checking out and kind of being with all of these different various states and emotions and feelings that we have that, that Dick's model addressed the racialized trauma piece well. And I address that a lot with the other podcast that I do. The podcast is called Rerooted, R-E-R-O-O-T-E-D on Ram Dass's Be Here Now Network. And I guess, you know, all of that is to say is using mindfulness, trauma, and psychotherapy combined, trauma healing, you know, modalities combined, I offer to white skinned or light bodied, you know, light skinned bodied people, a group on Wednesdays, which is called area, anti-racism, responsibility, accountability, embodiment, accountability, and action. And it's really about how do we start to take all of those nervous system regulation skills and bring them into play when we're bumping up into this really difficult, challenging, you know, very real epidemic of racism and use them to help us lean in and become active, you know, allies and not just performative. And then I also do a free TV show on Wednesdays at noontime with my colleague, Dr. Natasha Stovall, who wrote a great article that I would encourage everyone to read called Whiteness on the Couch. Mm. And it's about sort of how you talk about racism in the therapy room with your clients. How do you bring it in? How do you make parallels in terms of, well, you know, who else is oppressed or what is this, you know, bringing up for you? And, and also how do you bring it beyond the, the therapy room? And that's a free TV show we do online on Wednesdays at noontime Eastern. And then I'm going to be offering an anti-racism for white therapist course in the fall. So those are the things that I kind of do that we, you know, we can talk a little bit more about that course um, with therapy wisdom, but the main thing that I'm trying to do is my personal clients, a lot of them are BIPOC, they're Black, Indigenous, and people of color, my one-on-one mm-hmm. clients, many of them, not all of them. But then a lot of my outward-facing work is with white-bodied therapists or you know, light-skinned, racially advantaged people. And I say this in a white-body supremacist mm-hmm. you know, society, advantaged, not inherently advantaged necessarily, but just advantaged structurally given you know, certain kinds of access that a lot of that work is outward facing is really trying to call in people who have certain privileges, um, racial privileges that they're unaware of and being able to start to process what those are, what that's about and start to become an embodied Mm anti-racist. It's so important, right? Because, and this is myself included, right? But it's like, you know, there was even an article that was written about, you know, another, the context is like another black person dies and white people go read books, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and it's like, oh, I started a book club on white fragility. That was one of the first things that I did. And and look, there was a there was some it's not to say that there was nothing valuable about that action. There was, right? But I think a lot a lot of what you're talking about is taking it taking even one action to that next level of work. Like when I remember first learning that one of the main sort of, if we talk about problems that seem so simple and yet a major barrier to anti-racism work is white people don't see themselves as a race, right? And so if you can't right. see your whiteness, you know, as as a race, um, then, you know, y- there's a lot of, there's a lot more work to do. And I think reading books can be great and helpful, but there's a step between what can you read and taking meaningful action. And I think being in a therapeutic group setting, right, where there can be, where you trust the leader, right, Um, but where there can be some shame resilience and so that you can feel what you need to feel because you're not going to get through your any anti-racism work without feeling uncomfortable, without feeling shame, without having mm-hmm. difficulty, that you can do so in a space that can be helpful to your personal well-being, but also help you learn and grow so you can become part of a better humanity that if you're showing up, you actually really do care about creating. Right, right, right. No, I I, I think that that is... Um... You know, it's sort of the missing link. I think um, we know race is a construct. We know there is mm-hmm. no black, there is no white, there is no, there is mm-hmm. not, there's ethnicity mm-hmm. and there's culture, but those, but the race itself is a construct, mm-hmm. meaning that it's invented. However, mm-hmm. it was invented in service to um, othering, in service to oppressive, in, you know, sort of systemic 
divisions. And so it's become something that we've had to name and get to know and recognize is is a real lived reality, but that we're really, in truth, all just part of the human race. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, but systemically, when you have... Um, you know, populations of people with, you know, different levels of melanin um, being literally counted as three fifths of a person or as non persons or mm-hmm. as, you know, only used as part of a um, property. And um, all of this is in service to to wealth and, uh, you know, with generation for for certain populations that were granted access to certain things that um, that others weren't only not granted access, um, like the Homestead Act, you know, no black person got, you know, uh, acreage, nobody, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, these are FHA loans, you know, went 98% to, to white people as opposed to people of color. Building equity is not even post enslavement, even post reconstruction. It, it's not as, it's not possible in the same kind of ways because structurally it's not there. So race is important in those kind of contexts to be able to name and interrogating whiteness to your point is the fundamental piece that's missing Mm -hmm. because if we aren't interrogating whiteness and what is whiteness how was it created why was it created Mm -hmm. what is it in service to what does it mean for me to not really have considered what it means to be the inheritor of white or light skin Mm -hmm. And that's where the interrogation begins. And you can read a lot of books and you can acquire a lot of knowledge. And that is certainly important. And it can certainly work in tandem with having a head, heart, belly shift. But it's actually the subcortical limbic processing and the emotional learnings that we have around race and around things like safety and our sense and our perception of safety that are the things that shift how we end up being able to show up differently sustainably over time and commit to an anti-racist course for life and not just do performative things that we might do and say, oh, I read a book, I made a donation here, those kinds of things. How do you actually shift hearts and minds? And those are subcortical synaptic changes that usually happen experientially Mm -hmm. that can happen around race, just as they can happen around any issue um, that's a traumatic issue. But that doesn't negate the structural issues that are still at play that keep certain populations marginalized because it's centering a certain population that is um, most often white, cisgendered, heterosexual, male, and also um, often women. So. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a relation between when you do that individual self work, right? You know, so from the book to the group support, right? And then the and then um, you know, the healing that through as part of that change, congruent with that change, right? You're also springing into action where it matters on the structural pieces, voting, mm-hmm. you know, um, community organizing and engaging and continuing to use your power for the greater good, for the common humanity. Um, yeah. So I yeah, could see that sure. benefit too. Absolutely. I, I guess the, um, you know, it's always a both and when we're talking about trauma, trauma resolution, well-being, balance. It's always a both and. Like we have to sit with the discomfort, recognize we're not perfect. No, we're going to make some mistakes as we start to lean into this. No, we're not going to always say the right thing or have an immediate response. Know that we're, know that we're going to want to check out sometimes and not do some of the more difficult work in terms of learning some of the things we'll learn about, mm-hmm. you know, the history of the founding of this country and, you know, the way in which people were tortured and murdered and and things like that. And and the way that that lives today and what we see with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and everyone who has continued to really be sacrificed in, in, in ways and brutalized in ways that affect the collective consciousness of not only BIPOC folks, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, but also clearly of, um, of white people in a way of, are we going to lean into what this really is about, or are we going to continue to kind of dissociate and sort of defend and sort of say, you know, that was in the past and it's not really alive now, or he must've done something wrong because otherwise this wouldn't have happened and and those kinds of things. So this action piece, whether it's voting, whether it's bail funds, whether it's, um, you know, calling your congressman and, you know, literally working on, you know, certain bills that are up, 
whether it's interrogating segregated schools, like looking at whether or not, you know, you live in the suburbs and all of your tax dollars are, you know, going to your local school district and you can put your kid in there, but urban schools are, are floundering. What's that about? How can we create a more equitable school system, the school to prison pipeline, looking at incarceration rates? I mean, we just brought back federal executions, um, which is horrendous. Mm -hmm. And so who gets put in jail as a, you know, percentage of the population, primarily black men? Why? Unless we're looking at structural issues, we have to, you know, really interrogate that. We'll just say, oh, it's because they did something wrong. It'll go back to something like that, right? Law and order, everybody needs police or whatever. The calls for defunding the police Mm -hmm. are calls to take away the structural legacy of the origins of police, which is slave patrols and night patrols, which are about reclaiming property, human property of enslaved people. Mm -hmm. It's not about law and order. It's about property protection and who had the property, other people who were white owned property who were black right? Mm -hmm. So these are the reasons why these things come up. So when we talk about prison reform, defunding the police, or, you know, those kinds of things, and we're talking about actually like showing up for racial justice as a great group surge Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, going through whatever their mandates are and whatever calls to action that they are appealing to us for. The reason is it's a both and, Mm -hmm. right? So as I, as I can do these things non-performatively, but I can donate my money, I can donate my time, I can donate my phone calls. I can do phone banking, whatever it is that I need to do in order to get certain people elected, like you say, vote myself. But it's also like, how am I in this? Mm -hmm. And am I going to be able to do this in a way that I'm really committed to this process of awakening around the reality of the legacy of the core wound of this country, Mm -hmm. which is racism, Mm -hmm. oppression, white body supremacy, Mm -hmm. and frankly, capitalism, because racism is in service to the economic piece. A hundred percent. And this is like, hopefully the tiniest pivot, because I tend to make pivots and then there you go. But um, I recently, speaking of book clubs, recently did a book club with several feminist authors and we read They Were Her Property. And like, it was just a gut punch, right? Because on the one, like you see in these texts, like... I feel like as part of the white racial innocence, I think there was this white racial slash feminist innocence that I had about it before I read that book because you realize, oh, wait, women were very complicit in leaders and, you know, and just were very, very bad. And then also you could see um, the patriarchy woven into the text as well. And it it was just, it was, it was definitely a, a difficult and challenging text just to get through from the historical standpoint. And I think that was, you know, part of the benefit and value of getting the book written is to stop rewriting history. Um, and so I, you know, I think that how, how those, you know, texts can also teach you things about, you know, there's been a revisionist to our history, you know, women suffered and created suffering. And absolutely, when you understand how it, slavery worked to build capitalism, you know, um, that it's just, it's kind of, you feel it in your body, which I know we're going to talk about the somatic transference and everything like that. So I just wanted to make that comment. I don't know if there was anything else that you wanted to say, you know, specific about that book or? No, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying. And I think that that's, you know, part of the whole thing. I mean, when we looked at who voted for um, 45, a lot of the um, tipping point was around white women. And, you know, we sort of were a little bit surprised by that. And, And yet, you know, black women especially have always said white women choose race over gender all the time. Mm-hmm. And when you look at Emmett Till's, um, you know, killing brutal murder, you know, it was that as it often had been the lore of um, just looking at a white woman, forget about allegedly whistling or, you know, anything like that was enough to become brutalized. We see that lived out in what we see with Amy Cooper in Central Park with the, um, Christian Cooper uh, in terms of weaponizing the performative protection of white female uh, womanhood and mm-hmm. fragility around any, you know, sort of like, I, I can't be wrong. I'm going to create this other. I mean, 
Susan Smith, I don't know if you remember that case, she invented a story about a black man who took her kids when she really took them in a car and dumped them in the lake. Yes, I do and, remember. And, you know, it's, it's become that the psyche of white people gets put on black people, mm -hmm. meaning that who really did some of these violent and atrocious things here, coming over, colonizing, genocide, all the indigenous people, the Diné, the Lakota, the Opi, I mean, who who really was responsible for that? And then, you know, sort of, how does that get held culturally, somatically? Um, and, and all of that counter-transference projection somatically, where does that get held? Who, who owns that? Who holds that? And who's going to process that? Reparations financially are a huge piece, but also what's the, what's the sort of embodied cosmic inheritance somatically of what it means to have been you know, the inheritors of, of this kind of perpetuation of trauma and also sort of like lies of omission. That's why they say, you know, silence is violence, mm -hmm. meaning when do we not step in now? Because we sort of put it in the past and kind of dissociate and sort of say, well, you know, I'm doing this little piece over here. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to hold. And I don't suggest that we hold it and keep it. I suggest mm -hmm. that we breathe it in like a Tonglen practice and that we breathe it out. We breathe in the suffering and we breathe out the compassion. We breathe in the suffering and we breathe out the compassion. That we breathe in the truth of these atrocities and we breathe out the embodied, compassionate action deepening into our deepest intention, which is not only the awakening and the recognition of all of the trauma, but our own integrity and commitment to healing and facing the flames. I'm just, I don't know that I'm tingling right now because with that shift in your voice, right? I, I, there was this instant reaction to close my eyes and to, to mirror this breathing pattern, you know, mm -hmm. just right away, in instinctually, this is what I need to do right now. And I felt very, you know, regulated with the pace of your words and the cadence of talking about breath. And A, just to let you know that that was that was beautiful and meaningful and I could I could feel that. Mm -hmm. And also B, I think it 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 could, you know, really help listeners, right, to how can we kind of um, structure, embrace what we've talked about so far, but kind of structure some more um, education around trauma? And, you know, we've used the word trauma. We use dissociation. Um, we've talked about somatics um, and kind of given some highlights. And where I would like to start with it is just this, and it, I think you use wellness and kind of talking about the spheres in which you work. And so I would say from day one, client one, trauma was in the space, right? And yet mm -hmm. I wasn't taught in any of my training mm -hmm. um, what trauma is, how to have trauma in the space, you know, and as I became more trauma-informed through um, education and development, I also started to realize, wow, my clients were coming to this space and there are things that are happening to them that they don't even recognize as a trauma in their life. Mm-hmm. And so in that context, I wanted to just start to ask you about like even some of the basics on what is trauma, why is there a stigma against it or we don't recognize it in, in, in why I feel like it's, it's well, it part of against, our sickness, you know, it's yeah, like it it's goes an illness. Against the myth, it goes against the myth of meritocracy. Oh, so let's you know, go. Yeah. It goes against the myth of meritocracy, which is sort of like, you know, Everybody has an equal opportunity and we're all just going to work hard and then we're going to get what we need and get ahead and all of that. Um, if everybody started in the same place with the same resources and had the same everything, then maybe, but that's <laughs> not how it is because there are systems where certain mm -hmm. people have and others are denied. Mm -hmm. um, trauma, generally, I think the best way I've you know come to just sort of in a shorthand way describe it is... <sighs> kind of, you know, at an organismic level, you know, too much, too fast, too soon, too much, too fast, too soon, something that over stimulates the system, mm -hmm. something that 
the demand on the system exceeds the system's capacity to process, integrate, and return to homeostatic balance. Like that, that's not, so it's a, it's a dysregulated, interrupted, stopped process kind of state. And when, and it can happen personally to one's organism, right? If I have a traumatic event, like a car accident, I personally can have a traumatic, somatic host of symptoms and, and beliefs and things that'll, you know, come out of that. I can have complex relational trauma from early childhood caregiver misattuned experiences around abuse or neglect or um, unpredictability. And a lot of that is relational in terms of what I've come to believe, I, who I can trust and, and not, and it might be coupled with, you know, incident trauma also. Mm-hmm. And then there's like this cultural somatic, actual like bigger, less specific kind of trauma when we look at what you're talking about, which is these systems of oppression that are rooted in a supremacist way of thinking. What's challenging is it's certainly true that we're all unique in many ways. And it's certainly true that we as human beings work to individuate, meaning we come into our own agency. We want to be our own people. We don't want to have our parents be the ones that are, you know, still in our head all the time. Or, you know, we want to sort of come into our own way of being like, I'm living a purposeful life that I have ownership of and agency with. And most people's journeys in life are about that very thing, right? Whose life am I living anyway? The one that the people I grew up with wanted me to live, the ones that in my household I learned it was safe to live, or the one that I really authentically want to live. And it's that stop process of trauma or the beliefs around that that often is inhibiting us from from doing that at a personal level. But at this cultural somatic level, as Rezma Menachem and Tata Hosemi and some other folks have talked about, it's, it's more that there is so much stuck in the system of genocide, violence, oppression, because collectively, you know, this individuation isn't allowed to happen to certain people. And so, for example, Black people are seen as a collective in that way. And so there's no, there's no room for that individuation, right? Mm-hmm. And so one Black person becomes the person who is representative of an entire culture, mm-hmm. whether they do something right or wrong, right? And so it becomes that, you know, that, that one person ends up being the, um, mm, the holder, if you will, of the lineage of all of that trauma. And I guess what I'm trying to say on a larger level is, is, is basically this, is that trauma itself, unless it's resolved, unless it's allowed to deactivate, unless there's something actively done to release it from the system, it won't leave the system. And if the systems of oppression remain as they do, then it's going to continue to be perpetuated. And that's why people talk about reparations. That's why they talk about equity. That's why they talk about inheritance of wealth. That's why they talk about, you know, shifting funds. That's why it's talked about in a way that is reconciling, where there's remorse, where there's grief on behalf of people who have inherited privileges based on racial privileges, racial advantages, based on just being white. And that there's that that kind of trauma, that cultural trauma needs to be worked through in order for us to be able to actually move toward collective healing. Because it doesn't help white people either. That's the problem. Everybody thinks that like we're all just gonna win the one percent or lottery game and all we'll be billionaires, but that's not how it works. That's that's it's necessarily exclusive. And we have this because of this libertarian sort of mentality, this meritocracy of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, do it, you can. There's a place for that, right? Where there's a place for effort. There's a place for discipline. I'm not saying that. Mindfulness teachings call it virya. It means that you have a certain energy, a certain dedication to something. That's good. That's a good quality to have. 
but you need to be able to recognize that that's separate from, you know, being the recipient of this constant state of threat, which people who are in black bodies in this country are, that doesn't exist when you don't exist in a black body. Let's take a quick pause from this conversation for an important message from Bernie Salazar. Hey listeners, Bernie Salazar here asking you to support our show. Make your contribution at gofundme.com forward slash body kindness and 100% of any amount you can give goes to offset the production expenses. If 20 people can donate $25, it pays for this episode. Again, that's gofundme.com forward slash body kindness to chip in and support our show. We're so grateful to have you as a listener and we thank you for your support. So when we talk about system overload, so we can think of it like, okay, in our lifetime, things happen to us that can overload the system. And that is what we can call a, call a trauma. And at that point, it is in your body impacting your body. And it's not necessarily like, I don't know, something that you could just scope out and look for necessarily and say, oh, this physical thing is a location of a physical or of what we would say is trauma in a physical space, right? But we say trauma shows up in the body. So how would we explain that um, to people for an example? Well, I think that Dr. Vincent Felitti, somebody that I interviewed for one of my podcasts, um, mm-hmm. who did the um, ACE studies, the Adverse Childhood mm-hmm. Experiences Study mm-hmm. um, with Kaiser Permanente, talks about how all the psychosomatic pieces that came up for people were because of these uh, adverse childhood experiences like Mm -hmm. divorce or incarceration of a parent or alcoholism in the family. And if you have an A score of like, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, Mm -hmm. the higher you go, it's a, you know, it's like up to 10, um, the more trauma that you've had in your history, you have like a 6,000 more percent chance of being an IV drug user. If you have an A score of like six or above than if you you know, have what, zero or one or two or something like that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of this being, so understanding like what your history is in terms of understanding how you're impacted, those things all live out in your body. Mm -hmm. And, and for example, the way that they did this study, it was a weight loss, you know, thing where they were Mm -hmm. talking about people who uh, were able to sustainably keep the weight off. And then there was people that didn't. And mm-hmm. when he started querying why this woman was gaining the weight back and then some after mm-hmm. she had lost it, it was because somebody at work had been paying attention to her and was starting to flirt with her. And she had been sexually abused as a child. Mm-hmm. And so the weight, of course, was a barrier to being desirable, which mm-hmm. was a protective adaptive mechanism. And so you always have to ask, like, what's the need? Like, why are we Like, how is this serving? Instead Mm -hmm. of seeing it as a pathology, seeing it like, how is this actually serving to keep me safe from a very basic and fundamental level? And the way that it can be stored in the body is like all kinds of things, hypertension, you know, high blood pressure, you know, obesity, um, all these kinds of things. But that that is all, those are all symptomatic manifestations of an adaptive mechanism from a, usually from a prior you know, either series of traumas or, 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 you know, learned way of being when it comes to complex trauma in terms of relational stuff that is continuing to be employed beyond its utility because we haven't caught up with our present state, which is like, maybe I'm safer here now. I don't have to only, you know, eat, for example, um, in order to be uh, undesirable in such a way that I won't be molested right? Mm-hmm. That I won't. And that that would be where a more psychotherapeutic or a more, you know, trauma informed way of working somatically with somebody might start to uncouple uh, the beliefs that are associated with well, how is this serving me and, and, and why is this here? Right. Right. And so with the, like the idea, right, is that in working in a psychotherapy setting, or, you know, with some somatic experiencing, right? You can yep. work on trauma processing for people, right? Mm-hmm. Before I go into that, I was hoping you could 
help differentiate because I'm definitely reading a lot more about this and I have a feeling that listeners are reading more and might not quite get it, um, but differentiate between historical trauma and racialized trauma for people um, because it's, I guess, one of the connections is not just our lived experiences, but how we inherit the experience of, experiences of our ancestors. Right. So if you use a lens as I do, which is Mm -hmm. more like space time is sort of irrelevant. There's, you know, future, past, present, we're just sort of mixed all in. Mm -hmm. And that it's also like all my relations. So my ancestors are here as well as my future, Mm -hmm. you know, and that I'm not just this fixed entity anyway. Like Mm -hmm. I carry all of that, which was before me and everything that came into my creation here in this embodiment, in this moment in time, as well as everything else that is to come. Meaning that I'm constantly in process, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been dying since the day I was born. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a fixed thing. And, you know, when we look at a river, is a river a fixed thing? Nope. Is the silt ever the same? Is the water that's rushing through there ever the same? Is the sand that's, is it really ever the same? Mm -mm. So we have to start questioning, like, what are we thinking when we're thinking of, you know, what's fixed or isn't. So this historical trauma and this racialized trauma is essentially that, you know, a lot of the critiques of the trauma models, and I certainly have, have, I certainly have this critique is this idea of returning back into homeostatic balance, returning to safety. You weren't safe then when your dad was beating you up and he was an alcoholic, but you are safe now because you live in a nice cul-de-sac with a wife who loves you or something like that. Mm -hmm. That isn't the truth. Like that's not the lived experience of someone who is a black American, who is walking down the street, who is still subjected to racialized violence because of the implicit biases of generations of inherited um, white body suppression, white body supremacy mm-hmm. um, attitudes, right? Conscious or unconscious, and so the there's there's two ways in which the the historical trauma lives in white people. And that the racialized trauma is experienced by Black people today, mm-hmm. right? Like, it's not safe for a person of color to walk down the street in the way that it is for a white person to walk down the street. Yep. And I've recently, I remember reading articles to that point about a Black surgeon, a male Black surgeon, talking about, I'm always going to wear my scrubs in public from point A to point B, or somebody in, in, you know, two different outfits, same person in two different outfits. And this is what people think of me in this outfit. This is what people think of me in my work outfit, right? That to that level of how can you say that you are truly safe if you are going to be judged by the skin and the body that you're in and the clothes that you're wearing? Right. And, and that's, I mean, and so again, you know, a lot of people of color have had to do code switching and Mm -hmm. have to, you know, talk a certain way and look a certain way and perform a certain way and be a certain way um, with certain groups of people, white people, in order to stay safe and then have a more full, relaxed, you know, more regulated life at home. But just Mm -hmm. being in the midst of, um, I mean, I've existed in spaces that have, you know, been pretty much all white. And as a woman of color with a lot of light skin and white skin, uh, racial advantage um, and privilege, you know, I don't think that people understand that the microaggressions are, are, are heavy and unrelenting. And so while I've never feared for my safety in the same particular way that it would be that, it, that we've seen, you know, especially lately based mm-hmm. on my, my skin color, I've certainly felt as though that because I've been just a lot more than people are used to, you know, I dress a little differently. My hair is a little bit different. You know, I, I'm a little bit bigger or louder or something that all of those things are, are ways in which we're constantly putting pressure on ourselves to stay in a box and be narrow that people who are light skin privileged or white racially advantaged don't really even consider or think about, which is that whole Peggy McIntosh invisible backpack, um, article, which everybody should Mm -hmm. read if they haven't already, which is what is this, you know, sort of list of inherited things that I get that I don't even have to think about. Like they don't ask me for two forms of ID when I go to cash a check at the grocery store because I'm white. Mm -hmm. They don't follow me around the store when I'm shopping 
because they're not thinking I'm going to steal something because I'm white. Mm -hmm. But if you are a black body, just like Oprah was, for God's sakes, in Hermes, Oprah, she's a billionaire. She gets stopped because they didn't know it was Oprah, but because she has black skin. Mm -hmm. And what does that do cumulatively to one's psyche over time? Mm -hmm. And how is that like not even thought about when you're white and you don't even, well, that never happened to me. That doesn't happen. Well, that never happened to me. You must have done something wrong. Well, that never happened to me, you know, as opposed to understanding the way in which it's so entrenched. And I think that that it relates to this idea of that your your privilege is somebody else's racialized trauma, right? And then your, you know, unintentional microaggression. Oh, well, that didn't happen to me. So therefore it didn't happen, right? Another microaggression, right? Mm-hmm. So even in, in, um, white body supremacy, we know that there's necessary work to learn and grow in, and doing that learning and growing, um, there can be harm done just in, in being in process. Yeah. I mean, listen, I think that being an embodied anti-racist isn't something that you do. It's something that you commit to becoming. Mm-hmm. And once you start doing the work, you can't unsee it. Once you know, you can't not know. And it's a privilege to remain ignorant. It's a privilege to remain ignorant, to not read Ibram Kendi, to not read Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGruy. It's a privilege to not just bear witness to the atrocities and the horror. Mm -hmm. And I think that the ask for me, it's, 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 you know, my formula for, for, and I don't know that this is really possible or if this is what other people think, but my personal formula tends to be around every person has dignity. You know, there's value and worth of every person. And that person, whoever you are, who's a white bodied individual, that you aren't just, as I was talking to earlier, you aren't just your ego, you are your imprintings. So you come into this world with this, you know, sort of basic goodness, they call it Buddha nature, they call it, you know, um, presence or self energy, if you're using the internal family systems model, that your spirit is just your embodied spirit, right? And that you get a lot of imprintings and conditioning over time through your early caregivers' experiences in your family, societally, culturally, you know, through school, through church, through synagogue, whatever it is. And then we come to learn and believe certain things. And because of that, we often end up having other base self esteem or attributes that base self esteem or other kinds of self esteem that are all contingent upon something external. That there isn't this relationship that we have to our own psyche, our own way of being, where we hold ourselves in warm, positive self-regard, that whole piece around Mm self-compassion. And we feel ashamed when we don't. We feel like we're a bad person. We feel like there's something wrong with us. If people would like me more, I'd have more money or I'd have a better job if I were different than how I am. And white people generally carry a lot of this, Mm -hmm. which is a big problem because A, it's not true right? Like there's nothing wrong with you. You just have conditioned imprintings that then show up in these behavioral patterns that are not helpful to you or to people of color if you're, you know, have racist parts that act out. Mm -hmm. And that B, that's good because as long as you can be in that self energy and that presencing, you can bear witness to your own parts. Like I started the conversation with Mm -hmm. these racist parts, perhaps of you learn to kind of unpack them and then see what they're here to teach you. And then you can move into a place of, you know, embodied anti-racism action and work and collective liberation, because you're already separating yourself from yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what supremacist ideology does. It creates an other Mm -hmm. in service to an idealized version of something that doesn't exist. And so when you really look at the truth of, you know, when people say, well, our oneness, our connectedness, you know, yes, that's true, but we can't ignore or spiritually bypass the fact that 
even within this, certain people have certain advantages that others don't. I may feel crappy about myself and feel ashamed about myself or feel like Mm -hmm. a bad person or something, but I may still not be subject to the kind of violence that someone with more melanin is going to be subjected to, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a both and, but how do I work through my own internal block so I don't just hit a shame spiral wall, say, oh, this is too much for me. It's overwhelming. I don't know how to lean into this work where I'm trying to be kind to others or interrogate whiteness because I'm already feeling so unworthy. Mm -hmm. That unworthiness isn't really in service to anyone. It's a product of the same system. Right. You know, white Western beauty standards, you know, all the things you were talking about, like, you know, you have to look a certain way. You have to, you know, have a certain kind of hair. You have to be a certain age. When we look at how everything is actually just processed, like I was saying earlier, you're never going to be 22 for your whole life. You're never going to be 28 for your whole life. You're never going to be blonde for your whole life. You're never going to be 120 if you want to be 120 at 5'4 for your whole life. You're never going to be all those things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't even, I don't know what my weight is, you know, and even when I was having a baby and I was like, okay, I agreed to getting weight at the doctors then. And I just decided self-care was standing backwards. And, you know, and again, that had to do with some of, you know, cultural conditioning of my own experiences where it's just like, oh, this, this, when you can see what's unhelpful and learn to let go of that. I do think that 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 really helps you evolve further into a more grounded, centered, and whole whole person. And I don't know if it's the right words to say like less self centered, but you know mm-hmm. what I mean. But 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 to where you can pivot energy back into common humanity, like you know the if we see that that all those things are that they are they are part of all part of the same oppressive systems that some of that work that you might do for your own personal well-being and what you're able to let go of is also going to help you, you know, if you're feeling less day-to-day shame and doing some of that mm-hmm. work, that's going to help open you up to be able to do um, other important work, um, you know, like we've been talking about throughout with, to, to what it would mean to commit to anti-racism. It's not a thing you do. It's not a box that you check, but it's part of your human evolution. Um, a lot yeah. of what you were talking about made me think, oh, it's it's good to talk about somatic experiences now because like I felt like we were teasing, teasing that up. So what does somatic mean and what are somatic experiences? How can they help people? Yeah, I mean, somatic experiencing is just a way, it's a it's a trauma resolution therapy. It's a trauma mm-hmm. healing modality. Mm -hmm. Um, and really, like I said, it's about nervous system regulation and understanding where there are places in the body that are stuck and how to kind of, um, we're not releasing them in this cathartic way where it's this big whoosh or anything. It's (laughs) more very titrated, little bites, little bites, Mm -hmm. slicing it very thin. So I don't know. I mean, maybe we would do a quick piece of work. I don't know if you want to like dip in for a moment and see if there's a- would love to dip. (laughs) <laughs> you know, um, I mean, cause I think it's just easier to kind of do it experientially mm-hmm. than it is to just talk about it. Sure. But I don't know. Um, you know, is there something that's bothering you or that there's something that you're feeling like, you know, you get, like, if I say, you know, gee, Rebecca, you know, you're anxious, you, you know, you told me you were anxious or something, you mm-hmm. know, and, uh, and you, and I asked you where that was in your body, that anxiety. Mm -hmm. I would say that I feel it right now at the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel almost two places though. I feel that top of my head, I feel this like pressure, um, probably from my eyeballs and temples up. And I also feel something in, in like where my heart is, where I would say, okay, this is my heart. And it's like, around my heart. I don't think it is my heart, but it feels like, you know, I wouldn't just say my chest area. It feels localized more to where I would say if I was putting my hand on my heart, I felt. And that more feels achy. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Like achy. Like, yeah. Almost if I use the word sore, I'm not thinking like muscle soreness, right? It's not that, but it, yeah, it has an achy quality. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost I'm sensing like a heaviness or like a like a longingness or a a mm-hmm. sorrowness or something there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think. What's the quality of that achy? Is it got a texture, a color, a, mm. a sound? Um, it's interesting because I blue came to my mind, and 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 blue is it's interesting because blue is a favorite color of mine. So there's a part of me. No, don't say blue. That's your favorite color. That makes you happy, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's that the that monitor part. Um. But, but yeah, I think that it does feel like a little blue, maybe a little, yeah, so kind of, mm-hmm. co- you know, a little bit cold or sad. Mm, so with that blue, there's a sense that there's something colder there, mm, mm-hmm. a little bit sad there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm just noticing... Your jaw. Tighten up, huh? Didn't Uh it? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So just noticing that and maybe just saying hello to it. Mm -hmm. Saying hello to the blue. Saying hello to the achy, to the sad. Mm -hmm. And just saying hello to whatever the jaw and the eyebrows are doing. Mm -hmm. And just notice what it's like. If we just ask those parts that are sad or blue or achy or tense or anxious, if we could just keep them company. Would it be okay? To just say, oh yeah, here we are together. Mm And there's a little bit of blue, and there's a little bit of sad, and there's a little bit of tense. And here we are with those parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. I'm just noticing your hand on your neck Mm -hmm. and just checking in with what you're noticing now. Yeah, I felt something move into my shoulder. (laughs) Mm-hmm. So, you know, but it's, I can easily explain that as, um, maybe you didn't sleep right, you know, that in, while maybe part of that could be true, it's interesting that, right, that there's a part that wants to kind of jump in and diagnose something that is more literal explainable uh-huh. to, to a physical feeling. Like, yeah, you know, oh, maybe yeah. that wasn't a good night's sleep as opposed to. Just being with the experience, Mm -hmm. right? So the somatic piece is to really just notice and slow it way down and be with the experience. Mm -hmm. And the left brain may want to jump in and make sense of things and try to find out a story diagnostically. Mm -hmm. And we just do a lot of interrupting and somatic experience. We just say, bow to that. Thank you for trying to protect me. I know you don't want me to get too close. Mm -hmm. And can we just sort of dip into just taking one little bite here of what it's like to be with this experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it really is, it, it is very powerful. And I feel like, um, you know, pe- I feel like people who um, practice with somatic experiences, y- you know, by doing it, they can realize the benefit, but it does go, um, I guess, maybe sort of against that very prescriptive, this thing, that immediate effect. And so I really appreciated how you talked about um, how, um, you know, the left brain will try to chime in and make sense of something. And Mm -hmm. you could still maintain a calmer, mindful presence with what is happening. What are you sensing right now inside your body? Yeah. It was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. We're not, we don't give up the left brain in order to check in with our body. Mm-hmm. We just ask to just turn the volume down a little bit so that we can create a little bit of space to notice what's also here that may not always be on blast. Mm-hmm. And and the idea of connecting that back through to the to our conversations today is that somatic experiencing is one way, right, that we can 
heal from our traumas, make, you know, partially right in making sense of them, right? When left brain is involved, but less of just that dialectic talking and more about experiencing and having a presence with. Um, and there's not that that's the topic of today, but there's a lot of science around it, that it, it is, it is, um, valid and can be very helpful and very important, um, in what someone might come to and, sit on my couch and say, oh, I got to do something about this weight, right? Like say that is a primary complaint, right? That, you know, you could peel the layers of cultural conditioning and focus and, you mm-hmm. know, talk about habits and talk about these things, right? More the things, you know, the things you learn. And really when you understand about listening to one's lived experience and um, helping to validate the value of lived experience um, that really um, the way in which we heal as humans is um, also rooted in connection and living and being without judgment and um, in in connecting to ourselves. Absolutely. That's exactly right. And I think that that's a, a, really, a really good place to sort of, you know, encapsulate this conversation mm-hmm. for the day because... Yeah. Um, I think that this idea of it's okay to connect with ourselves, Mm -hmm. we don't want to always exile the parts of ourselves that we either don't know exist or don't feel good about or feel like are too confusing or whatever. We want to be able to be able to integrate. You know, Dan Siegel talks about um, having a cohesive narrative. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to um, have a more integrated, organized self. Mm -hmm. a more homeostatically balanced and regulated self. And as you move into that place, it's not to just then hold on to that. It's Mm -hmm. that you actually become more flexible, less rigid, meaning that you can have and lean into more places that are a little bit more challenging when you're doing, for example, embodied anti-racism work Mm -hmm. and you know what to do. You're more discerning. You're more wise. You slow down. You can be a presence about it as opposed to just being someone who feels as though I'll never get this right. Because you've already reconnected to your core sense, your core essence, where like we said just a moment ago, that like, you know, when you're willing to accept your basic goodness or your essential nature and you recognize that we've all been imprinted, we all have internalized, you know, thoughts, feelings, and beliefs based on our personal and our collective experiences structurally and in our families, that we can start to shift. And when we mm-hmm. tune into the wisdom of the body, when we tune when we tune into those places, we can start to do it in a different way where it's more like it's long lasting because it's more transformative than something that sometimes just with the left brain cognitive piece, it doesn't always penetrate the deeper, more subcortical limbic parts of the brain mm-hmm. where meaning is stored and from that meaning then behavior is enacted. Right. Yes. And I'm leaving with the the power of recognizing that um, you can't have one without the other, right? So you can't have your individual healing without also thinking of common humanity. And we know that our collective traumas, you know, of racism, especially is how it's rooted in the United States, COVID-19 and the global pandemic that is existing and that that it, like you had eloquently mentioned several times, it is a yes and. Um, Mm -hmm. And so there are things you could do as a person, but also I think it's so important, you know, of not letting that fear um, take hold to um, allow white body supremacy to just um, try to pass on by because you won't have your personal well-being, um, you know, and, and evolve, right? based on the imprint, um, without also doing the work. Right. Yeah. The global work. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's a lot of work, but it's also good work. You (laughs) feel better doing it. You know, you feel differently. It's not, it's, you're not, it's not a Sisyphean, Mm -hmm. you know, it feels more integrated. Yeah. I'm so glad you're in the world here helping people. What is your website so folks can find and follow you and 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 work with you on these? So I have maximeclarity.com. Mm-hmm. M-A-X-I. I'm like Mary E, which is my last name, Maxime, mm-hmm. M-A-X-I-M-E. 
clarity, like clear seeing, C-L-A-R-I-T-Y, maximateclarity.com. And that's where I offer all of my um, mindfulness and, and somatic experiencing offerings. And um, I also have a, a, another, you know, psychotherapy practice where I offer psychotherapeutic services through Brooklyn Somatic Therapy. Oh, that's so wonderful. Well, I'll have the link to your website and your social media um, and the references you mentioned today in the show notes for listeners. Deepest gratitude. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your experiences and um, your expertise with us. All right. It was a pleasure, Rebecca. Thank you so much for doing this work. Take good care. And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners. Please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash bodykindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook. Search Body Kindness and request to join the group for Body Kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com.